you've got a Bible, we're in Exodus chapter 25, verses 1 through 9. And we stand to honor God's word. It is alive and it is good today. So it says, The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the people of Israel, that they take for me a contribution. From every man whose heart moves him, you shall receive the contribution for me. And this is the contribution that you shall receive from them. Gold, silver, and bronze, blue and purple and scarlet yarns, and fine twined linen, goat's hair, tanned ram skin, goat skin, akasha wood, oil for the lamps, spices for the anointing oil and the fragrant incense, onyx stones and stones for setting for the ephod and the breast piece, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst." Exactly as I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and of all its furniture, so you shall make it. Let's read, or let's pray. I just read. I'll get my steps in order here in a minute. God, I thank you uh, for your word, Lord. Thank you that we can go back to it and that it still tells a living story of who you are, God, and what you have for us. God, I pray... um, over Matt's words today, that they would be your words, Lord. Would you speak directly to our hearts and our spirits today through his teaching? Would you be with us in this place, Lord? Let us, we want to be a church where you can come as you are, God, but that we leave changed every week. Lord, as we just take this time to draw closer to you. We love you, God, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Well, welcome. Glad you're here. I hope you have some energy today. Are you are you awake? <laughs> okay. Some of you are awake. That's good. I have a quick update that I've been tasked to give you. So, um, about our church and about the situation we've been in. Um, if you haven't been here for a while, you may not have heard, but we have. Uh, we originally thought we would have to be out of this building. Um, mid-November, and so we have searched for options for a while, and you guys, I know, have joined us in prayer, and we appreciate that, and uh, all of our plans have not worked very well, um, if you can imagine that. Uh, God's wanting to show us that He is directing us, and He is going to take us to where we are supposed to go. Um, So I hope you can feel hope and trust in that, that he has this and he is directing our steps. And so he has continued uh, every step of the way at uh, the last minute as he does to open doors for us. And as your leadership team, really all we're leading is stepping through the opportunities and the doors that God opens up for us. Um, And he's been faithful. And so we just recently got news that we can be in this theater until the end of the year. So we have more time than we thought, which is very nice. Um, So can we just give God a round of applause for that? That's awesome. We thank him for that. Um, However, I personally and uh, the leadership team, Jen and Jenny and all the staff and those volunteer leaders as well, I believe, join me in this. I am praying and hoping um, with quite a bit of faith that we will be in a permanent space by at least Christmas services of this year. So I just invite you guys to join me in faithfully praying for that. That's what we're hoping for. Um, That's what we're asking for, right? The word says you have not because you ask not. And so we are asking for that because I think that would be awesome for our community and our church and our people to have a place to call home. And so we are definitely open to that. We have till the end of the year to stay here, but if something opens up permanent, we will be uh, for sure taking steps towards that. Cool? Okay, thanks, Jen. Jen thinks it's cool. Okay, awesome. Um, I want to start by showing you a couple pictures, which Andrew saved the day and got a couple pictures, I think. Uh, Can we pull up the Dome of the Rock uh, photo, if you have that? Yeah, so that is the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem. 
And I had these cool pictures of me actually there, but they didn't get loaded on the computer, so you just have to take my word for it that there's a picture of me walking up the steps, um, and I'm a little goofy kid with a funny hat on, and it was going to make you laugh, but now you're just going to have to imagine, use your imagination. But that is the Dome of the Rock, and that is the place uh, approximately where the Temple of Solomon stood, and then uh, the Babylonians came in, and they destroyed it, and then it was rebuilt for the time of Jesus, the second temple, until the Jewish people made Rome upset, and they came in and tore it down as well. But that is the spot where the temples of Jerusalem would have stood. And the second temple, King Herod built this huge retaining wall around it so that it was more like a temple complex. And we have a photo of the last standing wall. This is called the Western Wall or the Wailing Wall. That's all that remains of the complex that King Herod built around the temple. And it is the holiest site for Jewish people. Uh, They believe um, it is holy because it was the closest to the Holy of Holies of the temple. It's it's the last remaining spot that stood by that. And so uh, people from all around the world, they they come there and they uh, put their prayer requests and their hopes and their their dreams on these little pieces of paper and they roll them up and they stick them in the cracks and the holes of this wall. Can I tell you the worst thing I've ever done in my life? I think this is the worst thing. I don't know. <clears throat> so when I was younger, right, I was a kid. Um, only, only the guys can go to the Wailing Wall, right? The Jewish religion has it separated. The guys can go down there. So my dad and I got to go down to that wall. Um, and so I'm standing there. You know, I don't know how old I was, 13 maybe, 12 or 13. I'm looking at this wall, and I see all these rolled pieces of paper, stuck in the wall. And I'm like, are these people sticking cigarettes in this wall? (laughs) Right? I don't know. I don't know what they're doing. It just looks like there's cigarettes stuck in this wall. And so, you know, I wanted to do the right thing. And so I start picking the cigarettes out of the wall, throwing them on the ground. I'm like, what is going on (laughs) with this? And luckily, my dad looks over, he grabs my hand. He's like, stop doing that. Those are prayer requests. And the Israeli soldiers next to me didn't catch me because I probably would have been in big trouble. May still be in a prison in Israel to this day. I don't know. And God didn't zap me for it, thankfully. Um, but yeah, to this day, I'm like, maybe that's, maybe that's the worst thing I've done. That was really probably pretty bad to, you know, people travel all this way hoping that God will <laughs> hear their prayer if it's just stuck in this holy wall and here's this little dumb kid pulling them all out and throwing them all on the ground and stamping them out with his foot. That prayer request isn't happening today. <laughs> um, so we're talking about the tabernacle today, as our scripture said. And the tabernacle and the temple in ancient Israel serve the same function, the same purpose. I think we have a picture, a model of what the tabernacle, not the the actual one, um, that is a model of what it would have looked like. <clears throat> this is set up in the desert. Back to the other one. Yeah. That's set up in the desert um, by Jerusalem, where you can see what the tabernacle would have been like. Um, the tabernacle and the later the temple serve the same function in Israel. The tabernacle, as you could see, was a tent set up in the desert, and the temple was the permanent building. So we'll return to this concept of the temple and the tabernacle in just a moment. But my message today is called this, on earth as in heaven. On earth as in heaven. Now in the Bible, heaven and earth are ways of talking about our space and God's space. Okay? I don't want you thinking of the sky when we talk about heaven. Heaven and earth are talking about our space and God's space. And we understand our space pretty well, right? We know there's grass, there's trees, mountains, and animals. We understand our space. But God's space sometimes can be a little bit fuzzy for us, right? What is God's space? What's it like? 
And the Bible gives us all kinds of metaphors and images to try to give us an understanding of what is basically inconceivable to us. Heaven, the unseen realm, the place where God and spiritual beings dwell. They're very different, very different spaces. And while they're different in nature, what's interesting is that the Bible shows that those two spaces, heaven and earth, actually can overlap. So I like to think of it like this. Think of them as two dimensions that can overlap in the same exact space. Are you following me so far? You can think of two circles that can come together in the same exact space. And we talk a lot about going to heaven when we die in church and in Christianity. Right? We talk a lot about that. But this idea that they overlap that they come together, we don't necessarily talk about as much. And that's actually really pretty crazy because the entire story of the Bible is about the union of heaven and earth. That's what this book is about. It begins with them completely united, and it ends with them united. And in the beginning, they were united, and as We know, if you know the story, they were torn apart by human and spiritual rebellion called sin. And so now, what once was united is now two spaces. God's space, our space, heaven and earth. So we have the question, how do they overlap now? Right? How do they overlap now? And that's where we have to begin to talk about temples and the tabernacle see in the ancient world if you can time travel with me back a few thousand years pretend you're living thousands of years ago in the ancient world view God's space and our space come together in temples okay divine space and human space overlap in temples that is their worldview. And so to get a more complete idea of temple, what is a temple? What's it, what are we really talking about when we talk about temples? So we're going to look at four things today. Okay, It's going to give us a complete understanding of, of temple. And those things are Eden, the Garden of Eden in the beginning, the tabernacle slash the temple, as I said, they serve the same function. Jesus and then us. What's that mean for us? Are you ready? Let's go. I'm going to mess with you. I'm in teacher mode. Just got done teaching class this weekend. I'm in teacher mode. So just if you get a dump of content, I apologize. I hope you've had a cup of coffee or four. Okay. First page of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the ancient world, temples are always inaugurated in a seven-stage process. What's a temple? It's where God's space and our space overlap. In their worldview, they are always inaugurated in seven stages. How many days did God take to create the world? Seven. Seven. So when you're reading that story and you see these seven stages, if you're in the ancient world, you are automatically thinking temple. Okay? You're not thinking the way we think of, you know, how did all these processes work in creation and all the scientific things. That's how we think. How they think is temple. That's temple language. Are you following me so far? On the seventh day, God rested. Guess where gods are thought to rest in the ancient world? In temples. It's temple language, and we could pull out hundreds and hundreds of temple imagery from just those first few pages of the Bible. That's what people are seeing. They're seeing, oh, this is a place. They're claiming, Israelites are claiming that this is a place 
that's a cosmic temple, that the whole cosmos is the place where this God dwells. <clears throat> Genesis 2, 7 through 9, God creates mankind. I'm going to read that to you, Andrew, if we have that verse to throw up there. <clears throat> it says, Then the Lord God formed man. Do we have that verse? <clears throat> then the Lord God formed man. And I think I put, oh, she didn't put the Hebrew in there. All right, I'm going to have to just tell you. Then the Lord God formed man. The way you say man in Hebrew is Adam. You say Adam? Have you heard that name before? <laughs> Yeah, so if you're reading your Bible in Hebrew, anytime you see man, Adam is already there. That's how you say human or man in Hebrew. The Lord God formed the man, Adam, from the dust of the earth, Adama. You have Adam from Adama. Can you say Adama? The point is, guess where we are from? If you ever wondered if the person sitting next to you is an alien or an angel dropped from heaven, I don't know. Either way, Danica is an angel from heaven. <laughs> Man is from earth. Adam is made from Adama. The Bible is trying to tell you this is our space, earth. So God formed man from the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. Then the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. I want you to see what's going on real quickly. This is a zoomed-in picture of creation. God plants a garden in Eden. Is the garden the whole earth? No. It's a place in a land of Eden. Is man formed in the garden? No. Right? If you've heard differently, it's because someone hasn't been reading you the story in its proper order. Man is formed from the earth and placed in the garden. Do you see how that works? We are formed in the earth and placed in this place called the garden. And when we read through and we start to look at that uh, account of the Garden of Eden, we find that in some ways it's similar to our place, to earth. There are plants, there are animals, and there are people. But there's also things that are unfamiliar to us in that account. There's a snake that talks. That's not normal, right? I hope you haven't found a snake that's talking. There are these creatures that are around the garden called cherubim. These massive winged beasts. And we're like, well, you don't have anything like that. God himself walks through the garden in the cool of the day. And apparently there is a tree, there's some form of divine presence that grants humanity eternal life. What's that story trying to tell us? There's a place here where heaven and earth overlap. There's divine beings and earthly beings dwelling together in this place. Do you see that? And uh, we know the story that one of those divine creatures, the serpent, convinces humanity to join him in rebellion, and people are exiled from the garden. They no longer have access to this place where heaven and earth overlap. And God places those cherubim that I talked about in front of the garden to guard it. He says, you cannot come back. To this place where divine and human dwell together. That's what the story is telling you. Humanity lost access to this divine space where God dwelt. Now we fast forward, Exodus 25, 8 through 9. That's our passage for today. And God said to Moses, remember, God has chosen a people, Israel, and he has brought them out of Egypt across the Red Sea. And now they're in the wilderness. And God says to Moses, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. Right? God wants to be back with his people. And exactly as I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle, all of its furniture, you shall make it. Here's what's interesting in Exodus 
up till chapter 31. God gives the instructions of the tabernacle in seven speeches. Seven, seven utterances give the instruction for how the tabernacle is supposed to be made. The seventh one is the command for Sabbath to rest. Are you seeing a pattern? In Exodus 26, God tells Moses, you're going to make a curtain. And on that curtain, you're going to embroider two cherubim. And Andrew, can you pull up that uh, model of the tabernacle? The, yep. And you can see the Holy of Holies there. That line that's right in front of the ark is where this curtain with two cherubim would go. So what are they saying? Access to the divine is blocked by the cherubim. Do you see what's happening? And you can read through this whole account of the tabernacle, and it is designed, it is constructed, and it is decorated to look like a garden. God's bringing a place where that overlap can happen. But that is just in Israel, right? And if you're an Israelite, your whole life, your whole society revolves around the tabernacle and then later the temple, that place where heaven and earth meet and collide. Remember, this is a story about all of heaven and all of earth uniting. So while there's a hot spot in Israel, God wants that to expand for all people, right? That we all can have full access. And so that is where we get to Jesus. And in John 1, verse 14, it says this, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And that word dwelt in Greek is the word tabernacled. Have I lost you yet? The word became flesh and tabernacled among us. What's the claim? The claim is that once heaven and earth overlapped in the tabernacle and the temple, now they overlap in Jesus. He is the tabernacle. And we see him going around in the world, outside of the clean space of the temple. He's out there hanging out with sinners, confronting disease and sickness, casting out demons. He's bringing heaven. He's bringing that place of overlap wherever he goes. Right? His life is a model that shows you what it looks like when heaven and earth overlap in a space. Heaven pushes out all the sin, all of the decay, all of the death. It overrides whatever's going on here on earth. When he was baptized, the Bible says the heavens were opened. He claims that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's right in front of us. It's near. And to the religious leader, he makes the proclamation that he is the temple. Can you just think for a second how scandalous that would be? You think heaven and earth overlap in that building. Heaven and earth overlap right here. You've got to remember, they have this whole story in their head. Our God created this garden, and we dwelt with him, right? And now we're his people, and we have access to him in that building. But Jesus says, no, actually, I'm the temple. I'm the temple. <clears throat> and Jesus dies. He, wrote, he uh, rises from the dead, and he ascends. Before he does that, he promises that his spirit would come. On the day the tabernacle was dedicated, the temple in the desert, the Bible says a cloud came and rested on the tabernacle. It was God's presence. And the people look at that cloud and they say, that looks like fire, right? 
It's a cloud that looks like fire, a fiery cloud. Jesus promises his spirit would come. In Acts 2, his spirit comes. And guess what rests on the people? Fire. Fire on the heads of everyone who the spirit of God came upon. Do you see what the Bible is trying to tell you? Paul would later write, your body is a temple. Your body's a temple. What's that mean? It means that everyone who grabs onto Jesus in trust and in faith becomes a place where heaven and earth overlap. Have you followed this thought process with me through? You are a place where heaven and earth overlap. And when Jesus taught us to pray in Matthew chapter 6, he says this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. What? On earth as it is in heaven. If we really are the place where heaven and earth overlaps, that prayer has to become more than just a nice, flowery, encouraging prayer when we're in a time of struggle. It is our obligation to pray it and to watch it happen. It's an obligation for us to pray that and watch it happen. Our assignment is to bring his reality into this one. Are you listening? Your assignment is to bring his reality into this one. Um, you may have heard the phrase, you're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. You're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. That phrase is only true if heaven is just a place you go when you die. If you're just trying to transcend this place spiritually, leave the earth, then that phrase may be true. And the problem is we get our destiny confused with our assignment. Your destiny is to go to heaven. Your assignment is to bring heaven. Your destiny is to go to heaven, but your assignment is to bring heaven. And if you ch get that category in your mind, if you change your thoughts to realize, oh wait, I'm a heaven bringer, then actually that phrase, so heavenly minded you're no earthly good, gets flipped on its head. You can be so earthly minded that you're no heavenly good if you realize you're a heaven bringer. You can get so caught up in your space, what you see, what you have going on, the problems that are before you, that you don't even bother to remember that you're a temple. You're the place where heaven and earth overlaps now. Are you alive? Yes. Everything you do every day either contributes to that reality or it takes away from it. There is no middle ground with this. Every single decision you make either contributes to more of heaven coming here or it takes away from it. I wish I had a uh, real practical model for you guys to follow but I'll just say look at Jesus read his life how did he confront storms how did he deal with disease how did he deal with brokenness he shows us what it looks like for heaven to come and collide with earth but I will say this most closed heavens for a Christian most of the cutoff of the overlap happens right here in between your ears you've got to change the way you think you have to change the way you think. Are you drawn to negativity? Is everything, everything that you see, are you just automatically going to the bad? What's wrong with the situation? Listen, if you're a heaven bringer, 
you have to control your thoughts and say, is this what heaven is saying right now? Is this going to make me an effective overlap place? Or, am, or do I have a solution to bring, right? Am I a temple? Am I a place where heaven and earth overlap? Are you dwelling in complacency? You're just floating through life. Just going in day after day after day. Look, when you go to work, you're not just someone going to work. You're a temple. You're the place where heaven and earth meet. When you go to school this week, you're not just another student going to school. You're a temple. You understand? You are now the place where heaven and earth meet. It's going to take some people who are willing to take risk. John Wimber, the founder of Vineyard, says faith is spelled R-I-S-K. Because here at <clears throat> Vineyard East, I believe we're called to be people who pursue on earth as it is in heaven. And we're going to step forth and go into that reality. And I want our kids that are here to stand on our shoulders and go further into that reality. And their kids to go further than they went. That's what we're here for. That's our assignment. And some of you may be haven't seen an overlap of heaven and earth in a long time or maybe ever. And I just encourage you to remember that the reason you weren't beamed up the minute you got saved is because God has a plan for this planet. And you're here for that. And we may be terrible at our assignment. We may completely fail at our assignment. But we don't have permission to change the assignment. Are you listening? You may never see a miracle in your life. You don't have permission to change your assignment. God himself has given it to you. When you pray, pray this way. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You may never see impossibilities bow to your prayer, but you don't have permission to change your assignment. Your assignment is the same. God's goal is the same on earth as it is in heaven. On earth as it is in heaven. Will you stand with me? <clears throat> We're going to close today by just reading, praying together the Lord's Prayer out of Matthew 6. Can we pull that up on the screen when we're ready? <clears throat> All right, it says, pray then like this. Let's read this together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive them who have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.